on green fish, this is back during the Cold War, all right? And uh, we used submarines and aircraft, I assume, to gather electronic intelligence. What kind of radars they had, how often they operated, what they sound like. And I, I don't know what all they'd look for. And the Russians used primarily uh, trawlers to gather intelligence off of us. But I've got a good skipper, a good friend of mine. We, the, we had a bunch of spooks on board, what we call spooks. That's these guys that I have no idea what they are, but they, I don't know if they're CIA, uh, Naval, I don't, you, you don't know who they are. But you call them spooks. We call them spooks. When you walk aboard and the spooks are there, you knew you're on a spec cop and <laughs> you're going someplace, you don't know where you're going. And that's, I didn't know what I was at that time, I was on Greenfish. I was ship's diving officer and battle station diving officer. My planes were on battle station's planes. But Captain, and normally when you're running, you normally transit either at periscope depth or around 200 feet, regardless of what kind of class submarine you're on. Now I assume they still do, I don't know. But uh, we're sitting out there, and we're on this spec op, and we've been out there 60, 63, 64 days. I forget exactly how many days. It was 60 some odd days. And the spooks were looking for something. I, I don't have any idea what they were looking for, but they were looking for something. I have no idea where we were at outside of being in the Pacific. I, I knew we were still in the Pacific Ocean, that's about it. But the final morning on station, the captain come down, and he always had me on the four-day watches, which I hated, because I made for 16-hour days instead of eight-hour days. <laughs> but he was always on the scopes on sunrise, sunset, and he wanted the battle station people on scopes when he was on the scopes. He come down, walked up to the chief, he said, can you think you can handle another couple of hours or so? I said, yeah, I have to, yeah. He said, uh, well, he says, uh, I'll take the dive and let you make a head call. He said, we'll run everybody through. He said, I want to keep the battle sort of um, 48 watch on, on watch. He said, well, he said, we're going to probably run to 10, maybe 11 o'clock or so. Well, whatever. So I made my head call and got a cup of coffee and come back up. My plainsman, David Dulcini, was kind of a dark-skinned Italian kid. He's my bow plainsman. And Billy Bunger, my stern plainsman. The kid named Hughes was helmsman. I didn't have a off lookout. So I did what they call stern plane depth control. By that you could hold it, it said, say periscope depth is five, eight feet. Well the stern planesman, if you go in the stern, if you get a good trim on the boat, you can porpoise through the water and, and hold the depth within, within plus or minus a foot. If, if you know what you're doing, watch what you're doing. So Billy's just snorkeling or porpoising through the water. David's sitting there, he wasn't even watching the control panel, he, he was leaning against it, got his back to it. And this is after everybody's been, been cycled through. And the captain was sitting in the, uh, sitting in the hatch within Connor control, and he was giving these depth changes. And like I said, well, normally you, you transit at periscope depth, which is usually five, eight feet for your observation scope, or you're down 200 feet. He was giving these depth changes, 70, 75, 80, 75, 70, I mean, just varying the depth, you know. And uh, finally, David looked up and he said, Captain, he says, it's kind of a funny depth we're running, and we were running at standard speed, which again was unusual. 
And he said, Captain, this is kind of a funny depth you're running out, isn't it? <laughs> Captain called down. He says, yeah, Davy says it is. But he says, we've only got five feet of water underneath us. I want as much water on top of us as I can get. <laughs> David just turned kind of white. <laughs> he turned around and said, Billy, give me a zero bubble. I got depth. <laughs> he yelled. But we ran in. Like I said, I don't know where we were at. But we ran somewhere about 45 minutes at this varying depth and speed. Finally, the old man slowed the boat back down to normal speed. I mean, normal submerged speed. And they're, they're taking pictures. And they had the photographic officer up in the con. He took 13 shots, said, I've got him. And the old man gave orders to the helm, turned us around, we were heading back out. And a patrol boat caught us. And this guy's pinging on us. Then there's another one showed up. He's, there's two of them pinging on us. And the third one shows up and he drops a hand grenade on us. Then he runs out. I don't know, five or six hundred yards, drops a depth charge. He comes back, drops a hand grenade on top of us. They knew who we were, what we were, where we were. A couple of three years before that, Gudgeon had got caught by one of the Russians where they weren't supposed to be. Gudgeon made a round the world truth to cover their tracks. We're over there and I'm thinking, what in the world's going on? This is shortly after Pueblo. I don't know if you remember, remember Pueblo being captured by the Koreans. Like the North Koreans captured Pueblo. They killed a couple of the guys, but the crew and the captain and everybody in prison over there. And uh, Captain called down, he called down to me. He says, Chief, he says, uh, pass the word on the phones to all compartments. Anybody that's in the rack, stay in the rack. He said, I don't want anybody up moving around. He said, I don't want anybody making any more noise than necessary. And like I said, these two guys up top side, they're still pinging on us. And this guy's dropping a hand grenade every now and then. Then the old man called the forward room on the phones, and I overheard him being down below, and I over, but he told the torpedo in the forward room to flood, equalize, and open the outer doors, number one, two. Um, I can't tell you with that what was in that tube. But he had flooded and equalized and opened the outer doors with a number one torpedo tube, cut the firing circuits in. All he had to do was push a button and he would have turned the torpedo loose. Now this was in 1976. If he had turned that torpedo loose, I wouldn't be here. Because the torpedo would have taken our boat. It would have also taken the city. There would be a city missing. That's the morning I think I got all my gray hair. <laughs> Again, I didn't know where we were at. Good, good friend of mine, E8 Senior Chief Sonarman. They turned us loose. They, well, I guess they heard the doors on that torpedo tube opening, they let us go. They quit dropping hand grenades on us. They quit pinging on us. They let us go. So I'm assuming they heard those doors opening. Because they, they make noise when they open. They're mechanical. But we got out, out of way where we, back where we were supposed to be. Joe come out of sonar. Joe's white. I mean, he's shaking in white. And he says, Red, he says, you ain't going to believe what I got on tape. And I said, Joe, I said, I'll believe anything this morning. He says, no, he says, you ain't going to believe this. 
He said, I've got tape of a railroad switch engine. Now, Joe had heard everything in the ocean he could hear, you know. He picked up this noise he couldn't identify. So he called the con, gave him the bearing. Well, there's a little switch engine running up and down the pier. That's what he was getting on sonar. And the con told him what he was picking up. <laughs> so we were close enough, I think we could have tied up. Oh my God, I say, oh my God. I don't have any idea.